Hi, I'm Bobby McKelver, a sound designer for theater and dance. Um, I'm going to be showing you overhead wave field synthesis. Um, if you want to look up, you can see there's six boxes that are just like these. Um, it's 186 individual drivers. Um, and what I'm going to be doing is putting the sound source down into the space here. So we were kind of talking, Marcus was talking about these sweet spots, et cetera. Um, sort of an artistic use of these byproducts or artifacts, et cetera. Um, so we'll be moving the sound kind of through the space. Um, I was commissioned by MPAC with Andrew Schneider to make a theater piece here a few years ago called After. This is Andrew. Um, we basically were, you know, we started making a theater show before, um, which is called You Are Now Here, You Are Nowhere. Um, and then for our second show, we had already, like, we were about 75% done with the show. And I had been trying to solve this problem of wanting to bring the sound into the space. And during the show, there's a period of intense blackout. There's 20 minutes of darkness. And the show is sort of about hallucinations and death. It's sort of the moment before death. And I ended up um, trying lots of different um, things, um, one of which was parabolic and parametric kind of ultrasound speakers that Marcus was alluding to. And these weren't really doing exactly what I wanted. So it works. It gives you very localized direction and very isolated direction. But I was going to have to get like 60 of these and then put them on motors and move them around. So first, we just started using people. So I put someone in a black suit. They hide in the back of the stage in the dark. And they would just aim the speakers at people. And we did this. We had a work in progress showing. And our JO was like, what are you, what are you doing? You should, use, you should use Wavefield. So he showed me this tool, not the mannequin, the Wavefield. But the, the mannequin actually, that's sort of one of the first things I heard was, um, I don't know if we did the demo with the voices, but there was all these conversations that you could hear and you could kind of walk through. Um, I think we've only heard music demos. But one of the most interesting things was when I would put my head like inside of somebody talking or inside of a sound. And I wanted to recreate that. Um, and perceptually, when I would put like a mannequin there and put the sound source right there, it would, like, I would believe the sound was coming from there. But what was way more interesting was getting rid of that and just putting my head into the sound. And so I wanted to do that here um, for this show. And, I, and I, I don't really like when people have to put on headphones or like mess with GAC or anything. So I just wanted people to walk into the space and hear something and watch the show. And the thing is, with theater, like I'm one part of a larger thing. So I'm not an electroacoustic composer. I'm not making an individual piece. I'm part of a larger thing. And so I th this period where, or where this wave field really comes in is about in the middle of the show. And so I can't have people like putting on headphones at a certain point. So, uh, you know, I started messing with horizontal wave field, and then uh, I run into this problem that we were just talking about with Marcus, where you get the sound source right here, and I can kind of get it to these people, and that's great for them. But as soon as I go past, they just start hearing gobbledygook, like artifacts, and then et cetera, et cetera. So that's when I thought, I think it was Marcus had this idea originally, but I, I had an idea of what if we put that here? And then we can go down. And then our xy, which is going this way, is actually going from front to back. And then the depth is actually going up and down. Um, and what I've found is that this, even though it's a horizontal plane, it's not really like a tight horizontal plane. It's actually quite tall. Like if you're back here and you're listening, you can be down here. You could be up on a ladder a little bit, and you could still hear it. So basically, I found that edge, which is about seven seats. This is like six, five or six seats. So you can actually get a little bit of information on the sides of this as well. But the you know, seven seats wasn't really enough for a theater. Two of them. So I put two in parallel and split the audience so I can get 15 seats. Because 15 seats is pretty common in a theater, 15 seats wide. These are just some photos from the show here. And there's a lot of, there's other moments in the show that I use this where there's a lot of tight, the, all of our lighting is on LED, so it's like instant on, instant off. And you can have 
like a sound be in one space while something's happening on stage, instantly shift to like action on stage with sound coming from stage instantly back in the audience. So there's these kinds of visual cues that I'm working with. Um, but what I'm going to show you today <clears throat> is a section of the blackout period. But first, I just want to test that this is working in everybody's seat. So I'm going to put a little bit of sound in the back row. And you guys probably up here hear a little something. It's like, how about the back row? What do you guys hear? What, what we're hearing when it's not on us is the artifacts. And they're annoying. They're not perfect. But, and I noticed this right away. I was like, oh, I can't get it perfect. But what I can do is put other sound in the room that's louder than this artifact. And then it works. The people in the front are looking really confused, but just wait, it'll come. You'll hear it. So this is, I think, what we were kind of talking about with artistic use of a tool that's not perfect. And that's sort of what I'm interested in, is taking something that doesn't quite work perfectly, finding out what it can do, and using it. So the jumpiness, using that. The artifacts, using that. Pitching things to that. Like, this is a tool. It exists. I can use it. I had a theater show. There's also practicalities, like this show's got to get done. The house is going to open. People are going to come. So I have to do it. So basically, um, I made something that I think can work with that. Now, for this, <clears throat> what I've done is actually kind of dissected out. Are you guys there yet? OK, cool. Oh, yeah. Great. <laughs> cool. Um, what happened? <clears throat> in this residency right here is I took out all of the surround speakers. So you're hearing a slice. So it's not, this is more of a demo of something that was an artistic thing than a presentation, than a performance rather. So there was, there's a whole, we have an ambisonic ring of like eight speakers, a bunch of subs that I rely on a lot. But what I wanted to show is sort of like, if you only had this and I had to do the show with only this, what would I do for that period? And so I made, I remade the piece to sort of accent these edges of it, of what it can and can't do. And I tried to make every seat have a little slice of what the experience is at different times. And I'll talk about the challenges of composing for this because of duration. Um, but I think we'll, we'll take a listen and then talk some more. Uh, we can go dark <clears throat> whenever you guys
Can we have lights? Thank you.
Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so I hope you guys got a little chunk of little things at different times. So that's what I was, you know, one of the, just to back up real quick, the original thing I made when I got access to this was for like one seat. And I made this beautiful thing where Seth could swoop in and come down and get to you. Seth could be far. You could have like the beep get really close and really loud. But what would happen is if you were sitting in the row behind, it didn't work. So I got half, I, I really wanted to make that perfect design and then copy and paste it on all these sources, but it doesn't work. So what I then had to do was figure out how, and with a lot of time, sit in each seat and compose for each row. So it's like the composition is different for, like this is nine rows. Normally we have 11 or 13 rows. I can fit about 11 or 12 perfectly the, in the array. So I have to sit and tune it and tweak it for each person. And luckily, I'm working with an experimental theater maker who loves the fact that not everybody hears all the monologue when it's going through. He wants you to just hear a piece of it and go by. So, or the fact that this did that was an influence on that artistic decision. So I tend to work like that, where I think, how can we use this to an advantage? How can I push this further? So. Um, for this, we normally, I've, I hear a lot more, you, you would hear a lot more sound in this design. You, there's like also stuff panning left to right and around in this more surrounding kind of way. And then this other stuff's like icing on the cake. So I took some of those sources and put them in the wave field. They're not really designed for, and we're losing a lot of low end and, and some high end. But I still think it stands as a cool thing. And it, it's something that shows what it does. Like it's band limited a little bit. Um, Having a bunch of subs really makes things better, and having other locations where things can go around is great. Um, anyways, we went for it to do for our show. So we had MPAC, we added, like I was saying, we were almost done with the show, and then we added this as a layer, which was insane. But luckily, MPAC is open 24 hours for people that are in residency, so you can use as many of those hours as you want. I would use about 18 hours a day tuning this stuff till I figured out what I was doing. Um, so that's us in the theater space, um, which is downstairs. And we were on the stage on the stage at 90 degrees. Um, so I'm hanging off like fly pipes and stuff there. As you can see, there's some other speakers around. Um, then we went to the public theater in New York City, where we wanted to have Wayfield. So <laughs> we rented the speakers. Graciously, MPAC was able to help us get the speakers down here. Um, so we did the show at the Public Theater, which has basically opened up a whole new can of worms about doing this show in other spaces with this stuff. Because MPAC has perfect spaces, has lots of truss, lots of rigging points, very easy to set up. Um, the Public is a very old building. This is the Martinson Theater. Um, I think I have a few more here. They actually... Um, cut into their grid up there, that lighting grid above the house. They cut the pipes so I could get the speakers up in there. Because when it's too low, uh, there's just the artifacting and the problems and the phasing happen even tighter this direction. So these seats start to get funky. And then all of a sudden, I can't get 15 seats wide. Um, so if you're really nice to people when you load in and you have lots of prep emails and they're very kind sometimes, and then you show people the static ball and you let them put their head in it. Then they get excited and someone has a sawzall and they're like, we got to do this. we got to make it happen. <laughs> so it's not easy, but you can do it. Um, I recommend getting the director, artistic director of the public theater to like listen and then be like, see, this is why I'm doing this. Um, so we went there, um, some people moving around. This is Andrew. Oh, I should mention, Andrew is co-sound designer on this show. So we both work together. I mean, sort of everything we do is collaborative and messy. He's the performer and director. Also, Alicia AOOs is, is a core creator, co-director, co-writer. Um, and then I'm sound designer, but he's also sound designer. I'm also everything. Everybody does everything. But um, what, one of the things we do, this is us at the public, and we sit and tune the location. So I have to do this in every space we go to. Right now, it's, it's not so bad because this is hung parallel to the audience because you guys are flat. But when you're on a rake, 
everything's different. I don't want to hang this parallel because I start getting artifacts I don't want when I'm like in the front row, the back row that's like only, you know, that's much, many, many feet higher, closer to the arrays, start hearing all kinds of things. So I found that the best thing to do is to match the rake as close as possible. Um, now, if I match the rake exactly in most theaters, this is a theater in Seattle that we're going to in the fall. Um, and I had to do, you see, it's not perfectly matching uh, because I couldn't do it. And the same thing at the public, I couldn't get it exactly because if I was exactly parallel, um, it causes sight line issues for the back rows. So I start just inching it up until it works. And this is about enough space that I think will work. And when we did it at MPAC, I mean, sorry, when we did it at the public, I had to do this thing. So I had a little bit of residency time here to simulate like this angle on a flat surface. So Jeff Abbas, um, director of stage tech here, had the genius idea of just moving the array. And I was going to like get ladders and build a fake risers. He was like, why don't we just hang the array? So these are some of the limitations I kind of dealing with. But ultimately, I redo the design in every space. So it's I'm not going to ever be close to like some kind of standard thing that I can like plug and play. I thought maybe I could do that. But ultimately, like as you can see, some of these seats aren't even, like some, are, some people are squished, there's an, a little bit more room there. It's because I'm not sure exactly why, but I can't get some of these positions right between. And it might be filter set, it could be just artifacts, but there's a sweet spot here, here. The next row is here, but I, can't, I just can't get it. It switches back and forth, which is the like denser, grid. denser grid of a filter, right? Yeah, so that's something that can be solved. Here, I just move the seats. I'm like, find the, put the sound where it goes, and then I get the seat where it goes. In a regular theater, I can't do that. So what I do is just, I don't put the New York Times in row C where it sucks. Like, I just, like, <laughs> you put them in the other row. Like, row J is for press or whatever. And so that's how we, you know. And so anyways, we did the show to the public. It was a success. We were going to be touring the show. Um, these are some drawings that kind of give you an idea of what I send to technical directors. And they're always baffled. No one has any idea what, why the hell I'm hanging weird stuff over the audience. Um, this is what I send to producers when I tell them that there's good seats and bad seats. Because sometimes you have a 22 seat wide house. And you know it just starts to break down. And in a minute, I'll, I'll put the static on again. And you guys can walk around and like hear the edges. Because it's interesting and it's informative. Um, but you know, basically, like here, the green seats are in the pattern, and what I, in the pattern, this is just language I use of, of like I can get it kind of in your head sounding in a nice way. As you get into the yellow, it starts to source to one side, and then in the red, it's sort of like not, it's just not great. It's like you can hear stuff, you can you kind of localize the sources moving around up here, but it's not the effect that I want um, because we can't take MPAX um, speakers around the world. I mean, you could try, but they're busy with lots of other projects. Um, I had to build my own, which sounds insane, but most of the things that theater people try to do are insane. And I was able to get a grant through the Simons Foundation that works with science and arts. We also did a Kickstarter, and we raised money to build duplicate boxes of the MPAC array. So this is like a few weeks ago. Like I'm in the process right now of building them. And so I just thought it'd be fun to also just show you some of that as well. Um, basically, I had a lot of conversations with Todd Voss, who designed most of the box, or all of the box. And he very generously gave me hours of his time, where we'd just be on the phone for three hours. And he would go through all of the stuff and give me some drawings, et cetera, and I'd refine some things. But basically, I, I duplicated the exact design um, for sake of time. I don't have time to redesign it. And I know that this works in a thing that works for this show. And the theater world just keeps going. And we have to tour the show in order to get funding to do new shows. So I'm building more of these. I also thought it would be fun to have, instead of 18, have another 12 of these. And then if maybe someday Johannes wants to build a wall of speakers, we can bring them all in and do a wall of speakers. <laughs> um, just saying, I'm not far away. Um, so now, this is what we're doing lately. Andrew and I are building, it's a little grainy, but um, we are assembling these um, at my house. And it's, it's a lot of work, uh, as you can see. Um, and I'm happy to, I just wanted to say, like, you know, uh, Johannes has said that, we, you know, we want to share this information and, and how to make this stuff. There's, it's not a 
this is not like a closed source design, and it would be great if more people were making these things. And I'm happy to share knowledge I have. I think at some point there'll be some kind of drawing that we could, you know, give out. I'm happy to sh to answer questions um, and provide like parts and stuff like that, and explain my process and the things that I ran up against. Um, so, you know, we'll I'll have my info at the end of this so that um, you guys can ask me questions. Um, the other big thing that, that um, I don't know, never mind, never mind, I already said that. Oh, you gotta watch for this, I made, it's worth it. There's a little stop motion video, this, when I need a break. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay, so anyways, lots of wiring. Um, it's not easy, it's Molex cables, it's, it's gonna take me a long time, but we have to get it done, to take a break sometimes. Um, anyways, you get the idea with that. Um, it's MDF, half inch MDF. Uh, that's, well, when you use a shop that isn't so great, sometimes they give you, they don't give you all the parts and then you realize later that you're one short, so you use a piece of pine instead. So that one has a piece of pine. Um, and we've been kind of testing and you know, the important thing is the, the distance between the speakers obviously. So um, the holes are cut on a CNC machine because you can't do that on a hole saw. I used to work in carpentry, I know a lot, but it, the precision is too difficult. Um, um, that's, this was one time consuming thing that came up. The speakers I ordered did not have lead wires, so I had 403, I still have more to do, 403 soldering, 808 soldering points I have to do because they just don't come with lead wire anymore. So there's lots of little things that when you get into lots of boxes of span living room now, um, That's a little station for testing. Um, that's basically the state I'm at right now. Um, so I've heard sound from the speakers. Out of one box, I can sort of hear some wave field happening. So I think we didn't make a terrible mistake. Cats love wave field. That's another one. <laughs> Very happy. Um, yeah, and so that's my info. Um, I'm also happy to like, we can take a second and we can either open up to questions or if you want, we can put some sound. I can put it up here and you guys can walk around because I think that a very interesting thing happens when it's here and you're not expecting it and you walk into it and that's, there's uses for that probably. I have two questions. Okay. Are you able to plan within my row? Left to right? Yeah. No, no. So basically I'm just taking advantage of the vertical dispersion of this particular driver. And, and it's, you know, seven seats wide, whatever that is, you know, in, in feet. Um, and you're not able to spend the same sound every year? Well, I mean, you can. I tried it. it you just start hearing each other's stuff. So I found that I kind of need at least four rows. Like if I have somebody whispering in your ear here, these people like kind of hear it or they hear a little bit. Mm -hmm. Down here, it's not so much. And here, if there's other sound in the room, you guys don't hear it at all. I don't know what you could do, but it's a <clears throat> question of processing power. You could use directive sound sources, right. which you can focus, which puts the directivity downwards in this case, so you won't hear the next row. Right. But it needs nine times the filters, which you normally use in running, I don't know how many boxes you have. Hundreds yeah. of speakers from one computer normally. Yeah. Then you right. need nine times the filters, and then <coughs> you need at least some computers more yeah. for running the show. But that's possible. So you, when you want to have this effect, you're not uh, to avoid the crosstalk in between the rows. You could use a directive sound source. Right. And I, for now, I find it kind of interesting because you, it, in a way, it's like my version of fading. You, like you start to hear something kind of blurry, and then it like comes into your face, and I like that. That's. But yes. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say. Like, I, yeah, I knew this question was come, gonna come up. We, we, so, yeah, I think the better thing for me to do is actually to, once all of our costs are finalized, all payments, I could break it down. And there's obviously a difference between buying many and buying, like, one. I don't think you can, eat, there's no way you can order one of these exact amps, like, for example. Like, their minimum order quantity for those, the company that makes these amps is 40, and I begged them for a year to make 26, and it was, like, an issue. Now, if there was a whole bunch of people that wanted those amps, yeah, we could probably get them to, you know, 
we could all combine or something. But basically, I had to just keep moving with what I needed. But I, you know, it's, it's like each amplifier that has 16 channels was the price I paid was $899. So it's not inexpensive. I mean, each driver, the price of the driver comes down from 25 or 26 to 22 if you buy 400 of them. Um, so there might be, I think if there's like real interest and people want to build these things, like some coordination for ordering would probably be smart and distributing. But I, I don't, I mean, it's. So, so I think we kind of gave the rough number of $100 per channel. Yeah. Plus the computer. I think that's right. Include, plus the computer, right. But honestly, the computer that you want. That that's with no labor. That is very <laughs> true. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> that's, yeah, so, <laughs> right, I'm doing the math here. Yeah, so that would put my boxes at $100 to do 12 of them, which is about $37,000, $40,000, something. So it's, you know, it's not cheap, but we're, you know, there, and then there's labor, and labor is real, and shipping is real, and moving the stuff around in trucks if you don't have a truck, like all of that stuff adds up. So it's, um, it's costly, but I do think, you know, like Marcus has said, there's other ways to do things. You could get those drivers and put them in the tube. You don't have to buy $900 amplifiers. If you're doing, if you have the problem that I have where I need 12 boxes, yeah, then I need Dante. Actually, the, I think the drivers, so which are using, so the amplifiers are rather cheap if you get 16 channels. Out of them, so you put Dante in as a network, and if you want to build this by your own and just you know use some PCB boards and whatever, right. you'll never match this price, and it will always be you know non matching, calibrating, blah blah blah, because this counts. You have to provide the same gain, you have to make sure that the speaker receives the same gain because otherwise, you introduce artifacts in the sound field. Um, so, I think that so far the easiest way to go for it, other than you and PCB design and you like this work uh, <laughs> and share it up so what's with the other. Do you know do you know if you can get tighter with the dispersion angle of the speaker? And and would my, I mean my intuition is that that would help with the with the focusing uh, row to row, but um, but is is eighty five at that distance ideal or is or or have there just not been experiments? No, it would be perfect for having so that's a good question. Actually, um, it would be interesting hanging the double array. Hello. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then using the drivers, which has all, they have, uh, since we have double shape, you have this distance, so we could control also the aperture of the sound field, in, in this case, in elevation, or here in, in the whatever exit you call it. Mm -hmm. um, so this could be interesting because when you have two or three or four drivers in, in parallel, then you could control the sound field and then you could widen it and, and, and narrow it down. Yeah. Um, so this could be very interesting. Stress. Then, yeah, you need uh, how many boxes? Eight boxes times three, so, and then times two for the theater, and then you end up having many boxes. Or you don't offset them and you beamform each row. Yes, <laughs> would also be a possibility, actually. So um, this would be another thing which you could think about to not using weight field but using it as a beam. As a beam, device. yeah. And right. you just steer the beam for one row, which gets very narrow with the many speakers. Yeah, and I, you know, this is rough design. I'm not even done with these boxes, but once I have them finished, they're, I mean, they'll, they'll need to tour with Andrew's shows, but then I'm hoping to find a space to hang them up somewhere in the New York area and work on stuff like this and like keep working to try to find new things. Right now, I just have to... Many bridges? Bridges? Below a bridge. Mm. Could do that. <laughs> so we yeah. Columbia, so if you want to send them up, it's at 125th Street. Uh, Great. You can send them to Brazil. Well. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but seriously, yeah, we should. You guys should all take my information, and we should talk. Oh, there's also tour dates up there. If anyone is going to be on the West Coast this fall, you can see the full show and all the full context uh, in Portland and Seattle. Um, we're also doing our other show in Seattle for On the Boards, and then uh, next spring in the D.C. area uh, um, in May, we'll be doing it as well. Uh, using both uh, speakers, both rigs, horizontal and vertical? No, I just use... I know, I know, I know. Oh, uh, yeah. What about using both? Yeah, I mean, I haven't tried it, but I'll certainly try it. I mean, because I don't need two 
rows. I mean, when, if I'm like working in a studio, I don't need this many. I could, I design the whole thing on my, six. My question is yeah. like, if we get the sound coming from here and another one from there, yeah. does it form the sound together with the two systems? I haven't tried it, but. You can call alignment. Yeah. But you have to be well calibrated if you want to do it for high frequencies. You have to exactly match the distance, yeah. which you do, because otherwise you get, you know, phasing into the So problem. when you have two parallel overhead, it's, you have to do the same kind of alignment. Yeah. In your experiments, have you been able to create an illusion of levitating the sound? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I didn't, the, I didn't do a lot of that, but I've, uh, yeah. I mean, I think the the thing, I, the piece I made before, where it was just for one row, you can, you can do that more gracefully. I think for this presentation, I was trying to do more of this in your face. And I'm curious if that gets better or worse as you turn your head. Yeah, and actually, it's an interesting thing to try, and we can put some sound on. I because I mentioned that earlier, but you can you can really hear differences when you move around. And we're actually aligned in a in a you know in an axis where we shouldn't be getting so much of our, our you know uh, inner oral difference. But if we do this, yeah, we are. And I wonder how important. You know, give me a swivel chair because I'd like to know self handling whether the thing. Yeah, yeah, we can do some tests for sure, um, depending how much time we have. But I think one of the interesting things for this show is that like, we didn't have complete black here. It was not completely dark. But when we do the show, it is absolutely black. And we go and tape every LED in an entire space. And we have months and months and months of negotiation about safety and things. Um, and it's really hard to pull off. But when that happens, the, that is the like the context we're kind of missing here is that you're experiencing something you've never experienced the darkness I mean, where it's been probably a long time for most people to be in that much darkness and then most people haven't heard sound move around their head before so as they move they're almost like it it's just really messing with people's perception because that you nobody knows that there's a wave field system nobody knows that they're causing that and stuff's moving fast enough that it's all just helps create this group hallucination. And the, the show is about hallucinating. And, and we've, you know, I don't want to say we've succeeded, but many people have given us feedback that they had hallucinations. And, and we would also like use ambisonics to put a little whispering here or whatever and mix like water and voice and stuff. But I, I really like that thing where you're messing with it, especially in the dark. Yeah, great. The last question that. Can you explain the ingredients in that closing gesture that you did? Because I think it hit all of us just extraordinarily. And oh. How did you make that for the group? Oh, I mean, you mean so we're the very last moment? Yeah, so it's there's a piece of music that's moving through that is, I don't think I'm band passing it, but there's basically, there's it's a Dan Deacon song. This is not my, I didn't compose that little pop song. We, we use a lot of pop songs in Andrew Schneider shows. And this is one. And so one thing that I was trying to do is make it kind of move rhythmically. Since it is a pop song and it's in this rhythm, it can like kind of like do, 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 you know, and kind of do this thing so that it's actually like doing something with it while there's this other stuff happening. And it's funny you, you mentioned that that part hit you, because that's actually the part of the show where after being in dark for 20 minutes, these lights come up very, very slowly. And you're, meanwhile, we've filled the theater with haze. And you just see this kind of like James Terrell light, th th like beam of light. There, you know, we call it a shaft of light. So, and you kind of look up, and there's cricket sounds and stuff. But the ingredients, like there's crickets, there's Dan Deacon song buzzing around, and then there's I think it's a pitch down staticky noise that I was playing earlier. Just made a thing out of that with shitty Ableton reverb, you know, just like a big soundy and, thing. And it spread a bit in the Amazonic. No, I, I I use just Wavefield. So I just want to save that for the end. It's like when you go big, you you can go big with the Wavefield too. Oh, yeah. So it went up too. So all of this stuff kind of went like doo -doo 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 -doo, and went up and got big above the array. But I didn't. I just yeah. I don't know. I was originally like we wanted more of that stuff, but I just kind of wanted to. Do this more as like a demonstration than a performance, but I put a little button on it. But you didn't use wave, uh, ambisonic? No, there's only this. The, that is the only system. No, hundred percent guaranteed. Just those speakers. I thought it was actually the ambisonic system. No, that's what I was saying. I purposely took all that stuff out, 
And I didn't just mute the channels that we would normally use. I put that content into the wave field and tried to make it work over the last few evenings. Yeah. So there's that's. Of, I'm pretty simply located here, and there's a lot of snaps in me that were very wide feeling. Yeah. And, well, what, one of the things I think happens, and Marcus, correct me if I'm wrong, but when I do put something up higher, it is reflecting off this floor as a regular sound source would. So I'm, I'm just putting a giant growl up there, and like it is accurate, and it's bouncing off the floor as if I had a point source speaker there. So especially when you go wider, really put it higher. Because yeah. As long as you touch the audience, there's a high absorption level. Yes. Yeah. Um, so if you have a well-seated theater, and many people coming to your show, it yeah. uh, behaves differently. You get less surrounding. But if you put it higher, then of course it bounces off the, yeah. the floor. And I have related to this question about sure. the absorption. I, I was thinking about the, how you manage the body count and, uh, in multiple theaters. And yeah. also, is haze actually has a different effect? I don't think, I haven't heard haze being a problem, but I actually haven't had many times to sit in the audience during the haze, because usually you can only run the haze. There's all these practical problems, yeah. but you can only run the haze when the fire department's there, and yeah. they don't want to do that for my quiet time, so I can't have show conditions all the time. Yeah. But uh, I, you know, I don't hear a huge difference. I definitely tune all of the seats by myself, or just Andrew and I. Mm -hmm. And then the later, you know, a bunch of people come in, and I try to like sneak down and sit in a seat. And it's definitely absorbing for those louder things. But I guess when I do those louder things normally, I also use ambisonics. So there is enough oomph, and there's enough sub, and other things that like when I want to punch like that. I was just trying to see if I could still get a little punch with just this box mm -hmm. for, for all of you to see like what you can do with these boxes overhead. But I, I mean, it absolutely, bodies always affect things. I mean, in any, any theater design I've ever done, it's like, you know, you tweak it all perfectly, and then the audience shows up, and you're like, oh, and turn and start working, which is why I go on tour and do all of it live most of the time. This stuff I program, but a lot of times I do it live so I can write it. Can you talk a little bit more about that, the other line? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Can we switch over to the other? Um, what I'm using is, uh, so there's sound files here somewhere. Here we go. I'm using Ableton Live to drive the content and the automation. Um, and I'm using Tosca, which we've talked about a little bit. Um, Tosca down here, uh, as you can see, there's x, y coordinates that are going to SPAT to feed the SPAT object to move the sources. So actually, what I'll do is do, do, do. don't look at this max patch. It's ugly. Um, So, you know, I'll just play a little of this for just a second so you guys can see. So, oh, let me get back on the Tosca here. Um, let's get one that's moving here. All right, so, oh, actually. Uh, sometimes, I don't know. I mean. I, yeah, I, I think it all is mono for me in the end, so I'm not, I'm not really good about that stuff. <laughs> Wait, which where's the DMT in here? Um, oh, right, so this is, let me show you this. Okay, there you go. So you can see those moving around. So I'm actually drawing the automation here, and then it moves the stuff. This is just the SPAT viewer that then over OSC talks to the Wavefield computer. So it's a separate computer. Um, and then don't ask me why I have this set up on a return. It's, I, I make messy Ableton sets. Um, but yeah, so then I can, you know, one thing you can do is then you, you know, you can automate your volume and your movement at the same time. So I had to write a little max patch to like talk to the things and translate the things. And now that, Rama's showing me all this awesome ODOT stuff. I'm going to redo all those patches because they're a mess. And, and the message, there's just messages and messages. It's, it's really dumb. But it works. So you go from MIDI to OSC to SPAT? Right? Yeah, so. No, it's not from MIDI to it's, it's, No, it's, so it's, it's, I'm receiving the here. The advantage of Tosca is because MIDI has a slower resolution of 127 values. Yeah. So just think about a circle. Um, so you get steps of every two degrees or three degrees, uh, which is not very convenient. So you normally the control tracks and the audio rotation at higher 
higher resolution. And so it can solve the mess such as directly to the higher resolution, and there's a setup file which you load into Tosca. Right. It's simply it's an L file. And you say the XML file, my first track is Azimuth, and it goes from zero to 360 degrees, and then you use the full resolution of whatever your DAW provides. Um, right. But over there, he's having a MIDI, so he's sending it to Tosca that upscales it to more. Resolution. No, it's not MIDI in there. It, it's not MIDI. So it's, what I'm sending out is, yeah, so this state, if you look at the X, do you see that down here? It's sending 0.81798. And that just goes over Tosca as an OSC message to a port number to that's just means go to my computer. And then I receive it in live. And then I, you know, I do this dumb thing that I don't want to show Rama because it's terrible. Um, but you know, I receive this stuff. It like routes for the X, Y, it makes a dumb thing. But it ends up making the message that um, Spat wants. And then I add the source on there, put a speed limiter because it doesn't work sometimes. <laughs> And yeah, that's, that's another problem because um, I don't know how much experience there are with programming language and stuff. You send a lot of messages. Imagine you have 100 tracks and three times, so X, Y, Z, whatever, how much control messages come in these bundles and your scheduler is going to go out and maximum speed. And normally, um, very many digital audio workstations send them in, in audio rig nearby. So you get a bunch of messages coming, which perceptually do not make sense. There's no reason for changing the sound source position, very fine grains every, I don't know, partial microseconds. Right. Um, so normally we use speed limiters um, built in, uh, which, is, which helps a lot to bring the CPU power down. Um, yeah, in 100 milliseconds, I mean, like, I don't yeah, hear it. It depends when yeah. you VR, 20 milliseconds would be better. Yeah. Um, anyway, so you should bring them down because normally when you switch off, Maximum speed to DSP, you just see still your visualization going on, and you know there's a huge stack of messages in the schedule. And so I think the longest was for me three minutes. Um, so you can get a coffee in your program, <laughs> still desynchronized. Um, um, but it's getting efficient, and Rama may maybe show you ODOT, which is, which is a, a, how, how do you say, it's OSC, but. Um, well, it's the power of what should I call it? Expression language for, yeah. for handling, for processing OSC bundles. And that's really useful. And the new version of SPAT is entirely based on OSC. So we do not send messages anymore, we send pointers, right. um, which helps also a lot getting, getting rid of the scheduling problems. So OSC is quite powerful. The nice thing is, if so everything is running on the bubble's machine, so why is sending me this OSC message to the local box? But you can easily split it up and say, I ran out of computer power, uh, so I take a second computer, stream the audio channels, and then set up a network that just streams the, the, the control data, um, which is really cool. Yeah. And you know, this putting in Ableton makes it easy. As you see the number six on the right just kind of bounces around. That's you guys. That's your seats that I dialed in. And so you know, when I want to like find a space, or like play this, which is like, here and I'll just you know move it around, hold shift, and it's a it's a dumb workflow, but you know it works. I don't always have enough time with the system up in a theater space to get the best method, so I just have to do what I'm fast at, and I'm fast at this. Yeah. In the case of the stereo tracks, uh, is there a kind of width uh, when you put them inside the, the spat? No, because I the width of the of both channels. No, it just kind of gets like mono summed and then becomes a single source, which uh, basically there's an Im oh, a single input source, so it's all getting summed. Is it worth to transform stuff to mono or should you just leave them stereo? I don't know. I mean, that, did it sound bad? I don't know. Yeah. Like, did it sound bad? Did no, you hear it? Yeah. But I wouldn't so, mean the workflow is to decide to put everything yeah. mono or you go with stereo, so it doesn't matter. Totally. I'm not good at workflows. I just work in a crazy chaotic way and then the show opens and then it's usually what happens. <laughs> Yeah. It, it seems to me that when you have these raked theaters, which is yeah. the standard position that's created the problem of the overhead sight lines and all those things are driving you batty, uh, that you have an opportunity instead of coming from above to hit everybody in the space. They're kind of like staring at the stage. So if the, if the stage was set up like a, you know, uh, a, a, a wall 
and you could, you know, you could hit every one individually, which is what your original yeah. intention was. After yeah. all. You wanted to have everybody individually addressed. And the architecture you need for that is suggested by this if you take into account the orthogonal mm -hmm. pair. So if you had a cross where you had the, the pair of them and it was pointed at, at, at the raked position. Uh, like add to, uh -huh. yeah. Then, then you could say, well, there will be a reinforcement from both of them at any, at any one seat. You may even be able to extend yeah. the size of your, your, your theater get out of the red X's and into the, <laughs> the, the periphery. If anyone has a space that wants to give me some time in it and wants to play with Wavefield, let me know, because I'd love to try all these. I'm having Brazil. OK, I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, could you talk about tuning each seat? Is yeah. You, are you referring to, like, a, like on a graphic EQ and you're going to Oh, no, sorry. You see it's, it's probably making sure It's position. Yeah. Okay. It's position. It's not a EQ. I mean, I do tune. I tune the other system in a normal sound engineer kind of way, yeah. and well, in a scrappy theater sound design kind of way. But I do. I tune that. I time align stuff. But you know, Spat does a lot of the time alignment if you're using Spat for ambisonics. But if I, you do some of the shows we do, it's all just direct panning. So I have to time align any surround stuff we use. But for this, when I say tune, I literally mean sit here and like scoot the bar until the sound's right where I want it. And then I know that location. And then I sit in the next one and the next one. And then if I'm like, oh, you know, I look at the number and I'm like, oh, that's like 57, that's 45, whatever. Great. Then I kind of like rough those in into my crazy mess. And then I listen and then I take notes and I fix things and I do it over and over and over again. I'll show so you. So if you have a clip that you want going from row to row. Yeah. Yeah, like this is moving all around, you know. And I'm like, oh, I know that that's the front row and that's the back row or something, so I can draw this. And then I might go, oh, let me get that one seat never gets anything. Let me scoot it down. <laughs> so I just, I listen, take notes, maybe change something, or sometimes I listen to a bunch of rows. There's no good way to do it. Yeah. Remember, there's no right way to do it. Cool. Yeah. Well, I'm just like asking myself why you use Ableton to yeah. do this rather than the Reaper or something else. But then it just struck me. Yeah. Um, so you could have then rhythmically sync, because I mean, the, the, obviously the power in Reaper is that it's got this great synchronous engine going there, right? Yeah. Um, so then you could dynamically or interactively drive different patterns of automation of locations of sounds rhythmically based on other parameters in the show. Or yeah, and honestly, Everyone told me last year to start using Reaper, and it's been a whole year, and I still haven't done it. But I will do it. It's mostly, it honestly, you're totally right. Um, I'm just really fast at this, and I have no time because I like work on ten shows at the same time. So I just don't, I haven't had time to learn a new software. But I do think there is a better way to do it. But meanwhile, like the house is opening, and I have to get it done. Kind of problem. Right, but that's something you could do here that you couldn't do in any in Reaper or something. Yeah, right? and sure. You could have sets of automation clips. Right. Oh, you mean, oh, yeah, I understand. Like clips over here or something. Yeah. It gets hard because we do all our MIDI, all the lights are also exist in Ableton. Every light that happens in the show, I program. And this, like I said, we all do everything. But so I actually like sit there and scoot the MIDI notes. The lights are in here somewhere. There's a lot of tracks. Uh, there's not a lot of lights in the blackout section. But then later, <laughs> you know, there's each one of these is a light cue. That's like Q9. That's like Q7. That's, you know, really fast. And what we want to do is like have a little like blink, blink, blink. You know, th this is not a lot of time. That's like a very short amount of time. This thing here, what is that? 0.5 seconds, right? So we're switching the lights on and off less than a second, less than half a second. And there's, uh, so we got to use the timeline because I'm like on the edge of that growl. I want it to go black and then light on and black and then light on. Like, in a very short amount of time. So I have to use the timeline. Um, everything like, ties to everything else. Was someone using the lower um, Video stuff. There was, uh, if we can switch back to the other screen. So actually, the, the, all the video stuff that we saw in the Schneider's thing was all Isadora? Uh, yeah, it's all Isadora. And there's one fun, like this stuff, he blacks out the stage. Uh -huh. um, and the like that's a shadow that's just a dark shadow that follows around 
with the projector light doing everything else. So all that stuff, yeah, it's all MIDI like tied to the Ableton set. So Ableton drives everything. Okay. 